Thank you, Ken. Well, it's late in the day, and it's late in the conference, but here's a question that we should have asked a long time ago. Why have we been so awkward in defending the nation? In the Middle East, where I've taught for the better half of the last 13 years, my students ask, why do you have open borders? Are you Americans and Europeans so embarrassed by your countries that you want to renounce them altogether? Good question. Taking the long view, this is a rather exceptional state of affairs. For the most part, the human race has divided itself into nations with long and binding histories. In the Hebrew Bible, there's mention of some 70 nations. Ancient history is a tale of heroic actions undertaken with a view to defending the nation. So what's the source of the European and American problem, which my Middle Eastern students find so difficult to grasp? The Latin word natio, from which we derive nation, means birth. If you have a nation, you have a birth inheritance. Therein lies the real issue. How should we understand this unease today about inheritance, and how should we respond to it? In Europe and in America today, there are a number of clearly distinguishable understandings about inheritance. Those on the left wish to overthrow it altogether. Its burden is too heavy. Nothing good can come of it. The left has wished to overthrow the burden of inheritance altogether since the French Revolution. In the 19th and the 20th centuries, Marxism was often the way in which this desire to throw, overthrow inheritance altogether appeared. In the 21st century, a new way of repudiating inheritance has appeared, and that is identity politics. What of the right? The right wishes to hold fast to inheritance. Conservatives who fix on the inheritance of tradition have been a healthy corrective to the left since Burke first articulated the conservative position, say, in 1790. Beyond this sort of defense of inheritance are other members of the right, if you can call them that, whose understanding of inheritance pertains to blood lineage. This kind of defense of inheritance is rising around us everywhere. We must fight it at every turn. It is a claim that stands for itself, but also a reaction to the program of the left to destroy inheritance altogether. Nothing more characterizes the current moment in Europe and in America than the need on the left to destroy inheritance and so the justification for the nation. And the need on the right to defend inheritance, even to the point for some of defending understandings of inheritance that the ghastly history of the 20th century has taught us to repudiate. The healthy response uh, to the left and to the blood right uh, has been understood for a long time I suspect Burke saw it, I know Tocqueville saw it. Man depends on his inheritance and can rise above it just enough to build a world with others. With border and immigration issues on our mind these days, it's time we soberly acknowledge the constraint that inheritance imposes, yet also not lose hope. A vast collection of different peoples with different inheritances cannot move from their home to another home without confusion and adjustment and in some measure of forgetting their national inheritance that each leaves behind, though in light of Luma Sims' remarks yesterday, I think this needs to be attenuated. Assimilation takes time, it requires a host of formal and informal institutional provisions to ease immigrants to their new national life. There is nevertheless a workable policy somewhere between a completely porous border and an impermeable one which allows us to encourage citizens within the borders to live from and rise just above, enough above their inheritance to build a world together. Now all this you know, and under normal circumstances, this sort of understanding might prevail today, as it has in the past. But these are not normal circumstances. Europeans and Americans cannot think soberly about nations and their borders because they are haunted and embarrassed by their national inheritance. The reason for this is the rise of identity politics, by which I mean that politics is concerned singularly with identifying inherited guilt and innocence stain and purity, and my thesis, which I will not develop right now, is that it emerged as a consequence of the collapse of the mainline churches in the 1960s and the 1970s. The categories of, of transgression and innocence did not disappear in America, even though the young people will claim that they're nuns. In point of fact, they don't need to go to church to find a theology of innocence and transgression. They need to go to identity politics, and that's as far as they need to go. All those who play by the rules of identity politics are concerned with one thing, 
covering over their transgressions by scapegoating another so that they can be counted among the innocents. If you are non-Western, you must scapegoat the West. If you are Western, you must hide your stain behind scapegoating aspects of that inheritance from which you yourself purportedly suffer, capitalism, dirty fossil fuels, heteronormativity, toxic masculinity, the presence of deplorables in your country, etc. We all need a cover that hides our transgressions, thus declares identity politics. In this kind of politics, no European or American dare defend their nation and its borders. That is because in identity politics, every European and every American is stained with the blood of their national inheritance. Identity politics offers you the gospel good news, however. Your path to redemption involves a renunciation of your national affiliation and the embrace of EU or some sort of world government. Then and only then will your sins be forgiven. There can be no redemption within the framework of the nations. That is the lesson identity politics teaches. That is why the monuments of the past are being torn down all around us. To defend them or the nation is to reject salvation itself. We must be clear why identity politics has overshadowed the reasonable, responsible position on nations and their borders. The West remains under the spell of Christian categories of transgression and innocence, even if its churches no longer play the part they once did of providing a compelling account of just where and how transgression play out in the world and in eternity. Pondering the future of the West in 1887, Nietzsche wrote, it is the church and not its poison that offends us. By this, he meant that in his century and for the next several centuries, the West could neither quite renounce nor return to Christianity. The recent appearance of identity politics in America and in Europe, the politics, but not the theology, of transgression and innocence confirms Nietzsche's prophecy. The disequilibrium of Christianity since the Enlightenment, the inability to fully repudiate or fully embrace the religious inheritance of the West has made it difficult for many Europeans and Americans to sleep well at night. Compounding this debilitation has been a twin development that could not have arisen to prominence at a more inopportune moment. On both sides of the Atlantic, citizens are haunted by the historical wounds their nations have authored. In America, the wound of slavery. In Europe, the wound of colonialism. At the very moment when these historical wounds highlighted the need to make all things new, to what healing power could European and American transgressors appeal? More than a half century after the echo of the wound of slavery reappeared with resounding fury in the American, America during the civil rights era, and the wound of colonialism in Europe became fully and painfully visible after World War II, the answer given by identity politics is that no healing power whatsoever is available to Americans and to Europeans. What of the aggrieved innocents? Because forgiveness has been banished, their portion is unyielding and unending rage. Let us have our reasoned discussions about borders. Those on the left, whose chosen path to redemption has been to embrace the EU or world government, will not listen. For them, anything less than the complete renunciation of the nation is a veiled defense of filth. Those on the far right who have gone beyond the inheritance of tradition of the inherit to the inheritance of blood will not listen either. They too want purity of blood. If we wish to keep our nations, if we see the limits and dangers of the left and of the blood right, if we want to avoid them, our debates about policies will not be enough. Something much deeper is needed, namely a spiritual awareness that the world cannot be made pure by man, as those who advocate the abandonment of the nation believe. Christianity once declared that man's uncleanness was only overcome through the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Today, we are searching for worldly solutions to man's transgression and uncleanliness. The repudiation of the nation has, for the moment, become the path to salvation for Western man, the man who still seeks salvation from his transgressions in a world in which God is dead. That is the real reason why conversations about the nation and their borders are so difficult to have today. That's not all. Not only does identity politics declare that our nations are stained, so too are our families and our religious establishments, our social clubs, our neighborhoods, 
and our local governments. In short, the mediating institutions so necessary for all of us, and especially the least among us, to thrive within our national home. Tocqueville long ago noted that, quote, local life is composed of coarser elements, end quote, which elites will always grow impatient over. Identity politics de de declares them to be stained and impure as well. Until we are able to believe and declare that suffering, hardship, prejudice, impurity, and stain are not arguments against life, and that no prior transgression can destroy hope, we will have no answer to the indictment identity politics levels against inheritance. Therein lies the deepest problem conservatism faces today. I'm gonna to say it again. Until we are able to believe and declare that suffering, hardship, prejudice, impurity, and stain are not arguments against life, and that no prior transgression can destroy hope, we will have no answer to the indictment identity politics levels against inheritance. Thank you. <laughs>